Welcome to the Movement Podcast. This show is all about movement. We tackle it from different angles, bring on guests, answer questions, go on a few tangents, and give practical advice, giving you guys a better idea of how you can optimize the human body to be the best it can be. Let me give you a preview of what's coming up in this episode. On this episode, Lee and Gray sit down with longtime friend, Sue Falsoni. Sue was the first female head athletic trainer in any of the major American professional sports leagues as the head AT for the Dodgers and U.S. Soccer's men's national team. She is also the author of Bridge the Gap, From Rehab to Performance. We get started with her career path and ascent to training elite athletes, along with her use of the FMS screening system. They talk about athletes' incredible ability to compensate when they have dysfunction and the crucial importance of long-term joint health while keeping to short-term performance goals. Today's episode is for the professionals. It's a deep dive for those wanting to learn more about Eastern medicine techniques and how to incorporate them into practice. Sue and the guys explain dry needling and how it resets the mind-body connection. All of this and more on today's episode of the Movement Podcast, powered by FMS. Sue, I really appreciate you coming on. Um, this is great. I mean, you have so much uh, information to share. We've, we've known each other, shoot, probably going on 20 years. Uh, it's been a while. Yeah. So I really appreciate you coming on. We're going to get into a lot of different different things today. But give us just a little bit of your background from, you know, where we met to what you're doing now. Gosh, we met way back at Athletes Performance, right? Back in probably 2001, right? When I started uh started working there. So yeah, almost 20 years at this point, which is insanity. Um, prior to that, I went to PT school, which was an undergraduate degree, uh, which shows my age. Um, and then, uh, moved down to North Carolina, had my first job, started work, uh, started working at an outpatient orthopedic clinic there, and then went back to University of North Carolina. Uh, that's where I did my sports medicine stuff, moved out in Arizona. How did uh, they Arizona. find you? And how did they what? How did, how did athletes performance find you? How did you make that connection and realize that that environment would probably be where you could really run as fast as you wanted? Now, it's actually kind of a crazy story. So I just moved out to Arizona for sun. Like I did not move out. Here for anything. I had broken up with my boyfriend. So like, you know, my life was over and moved out here with friend. And we literally pulled off the first exit that said Phoenix city limits and got an apartment like, for, I don't know, six months. And I just was supposed to move out here to figure out my life. And then, um, randomly read the article about Nomar Garcia Parra. He had won the batting title that year and he was on the cover of sports illustrated, you know, the one he was like holding the bat behind his, behind his head. And so read that article and saw that he trained with Mark, this guy named Mark Verstegen out in Tempe, Arizona. And I went to the library, uh, <laughs> <laughs> because I didn't have a computer, right? That's how long ago this was. I didn't have a computer, went to the library, typed up a resume, looked up their phone number in an actual phone book. And it said athletes performance called, um, Vonda, who was Mark's, um, sorry. I knew we were not going to make an hour without my dog barking. That's all right. It's part of, part of the process. I thought it was Lee for a minute. I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> went down, started volunteering there at half half days, um, which was fun. And it sort of gradually eventually grew into a full-time position. So I met Mark on a complete whim off of a sports illustrated article and it flowed from there. All right. That's funny because I met Mark on the article in outside magazine where he's standing with a bar across his shoulders on a stability ball. And it said, welcome to your future sissy boy. We're looking at it in the clinic and it's sitting there on the desk and the phone rings and it's Daryl. Uh, Edo, and he basically says, Hey, are you guys, are you the guys doing the movement screen? We saw your presentation at NSCA. Would you be interested in coming down here to Florida and talk about the screen? So basically Mark did exactly what we wish everybody would do instead of taking the screen and probing it on his athletes. He got the whole staff in there and we did, you know, the FMS on the whole staff back in the day. And of course they got competitive right away, uh, sure. about it, but yeah. So Two Mark Verstegen stories <laughs> precipitated with the magazine article. So it's like you're a little bit starstruck at first because he's making the news. And then all of a sudden you're in conversation the very next yeah, day. So. Those are such random Mark stories, right? Um, super, super great stories. 
when you started at, at Athletes Performance, you were working primarily as a physical therapist and just taking care of the injured guys. And then, and right now, you know, you've kind of made a name for yourself, so to speak, and being able to take as a physical therapist to kind of bridge that gap, you know, plug the book, bridge that gap to where you get them back on the field and back into the hands of strength conditioning. Is that where you started to really appreciate that process? Yeah, absolutely. Um, when I started working with Mark, I was the only wow. physical therapist there. And, you know, we were evaluating um, everybody that came through the door, right? Top to bottom, I would start at their big toe, I would work my way up and I would do this big, intricate, long evaluation. And as we got busier and as we started seeing more athletes, I quickly realized that there was no chance I was going to be able to evaluate every single person that walked through the door to that level of detail. And so what we started doing immediately was utilizing the FMS in order to screen people on, okay, who was safe to go train, um, who needed Sue's attention immediately, who's needed Sue's attention within the next week or two. Um, and, and that's how we started to kind of divide out the athletes. So yeah, you know, as one physical therapist, you can only go so far well, and that's how we, you articulated all we ever really meant by that was if you have a screen and it's well vetted, it will tell you who needs assessment and letting people decide whether they need assessment or not, or letting maybe a, a coach decide whether they need assessment. That, that doesn't mean there's not a question here, but a screen will tell you which assessment is necessary. And I think that that in musculoskeletal medicine, we jump right to assessment thinking it's better, but really it's an exercise in confirmation bias. And what you're describing, so it's a, pro, it's a system, it's a process. You guys had a way to process, even at that level, that elite level, a way to process uh, those guys in a way that you knew that the person, you were going to put them in the right bucket they needed to be in. Screening is the only way you can scale service at the level you guys were growing at the time. And I think we realized the same thing. We got unbelievably busy and yet reducing quality of care was not an option. So we basically directed the care where it was needed and the coaching and training and instruction where it was needed. Yeah. And then we ended up actually doing this exact same thing at the Dodgers. So when I um, was with the LA Dodgers, we, you know, you have 160, 180 guys within your entire firm system. So how are you supposed to evaluate all of those people? And so we started doing the exact same thing, utilizing the FMS people that got you know, twos and threes, they went into the, um, they went into the weight room, they trained as needed. And, you know, if there was an issue, the strength coaches brought it back to us. The people who had ones were placed in more of a, a corrective exercise kind of a bucket. And so we had different things that we would sort of determine, okay, th this is a mobility person, or this is a stability person. And so we created these kind of pre heavy programs for lack of a better word for them to work on until I could get to them and figure out what would make them safe in the weight room. And then people who had zeros were the ones that I immediately evaluated and created a program and referred to the MD and kind of got the whole medical model going. So, you know, for me, the FMS was always exactly that, trying to just put people in buckets so I could offer better service across the board to the hundreds of athletes that were sitting in front of me. Yeah, that's, that's interesting about baseball because you make too many people make the assumption that when you're with, when you say you're with the Dodgers, they just think that top major league team and you got 20, 30 guys that you got to deal with. Well, that's, that's not overwhelming, but when you've got a hundred and would you say 60 or 70 guys oh, all over the country, that's right. Twos and threes can usually be managed and sometimes even improved with a good strength conditioning fundamental perspective. You've been close to that your entire career. So you don't worry about twos and threes in the weight room because the coaches speak the same language. Zeros everyone's an individual and every one of them's got a different thumbprint, so to speak. So you got to be CSI on that to really render care back to the original. It's the ones where I'd like to ask you a question. There are people who are going to the hall of fame who have ones, but they seem to know it. They seem to be aware of it and they've already figured out their solution and any help you can give them because it doesn't seem to be changing and it could be structural. And then they're the people who are ones and they have absolutely no idea. And that's where I think the biggest risk is not the fact that you have a one that you have one and have no idea that you have a one, which is basically you have mobility and stability measures below the average non-athletic human. 
<laughs> you know, that's, that's, and, and how do you have that discussion? How do you get there? Yeah, I, I think you make a great point, right? I think the beauty of, especially the athletes at the level that I work with them at, they are fantastic compensators. And I think it's funny when people talk about movement inefficiency or how compensations are in a movement inefficiency. I always tell people movement compensations are extremely efficient. These people have had this movement pattern for potentially decades. Everything about it is efficient because that's how they're programmed to move. And so when we begin to break down some of those things or try to intervene with some of those ones, we can make them inefficient because we're trying to alter how they're moving. And so, um, yeah, I, I think that's a great point because the people who are ones that understand that they've got some limitations, they've figured out how to work beyond those limitations yes. and they figured out how to compensate. And they're yep. very successful with those strategies that they've come up with. And I think as interventionists, we have to be extremely careful on what compensations we decide to take away from them. No, I think that's very good. And secondly, having the baseline, when you take somebody who was a one but not aware of it and you do a corrective and you see, oh my gosh, their toe touch changed by eight inches. And they're like, did this even change? They're commenting on the same level of tension. They have no idea that proprioceptively, they just covered a mark. Those, those are the people that are dangerous because they just got some mobility without any responsibility <laughs> for That's it. That's right. <laughs> so I like to, you know, I could give you an inch of length. I'm going to give you an ounce of strength. And I'd rather grow it that way if this, this is an issue because you better be there with some tape and stabilization and a lot of cueing and biofeedback if you create this amazing amount of mobility and then don't responsibly backfill that. So. Well, Sue, in, your, in the world you were in, <clears throat> dealing with those elite athletes, there's only so much you can do because they've got to go out there and perform. So you recognize that they've got a compensation. They're a, you know, they're a one, which means they've got very poor fundamental movements. But, and you got to you got to work on getting them better. But at the end of the day, they're going to go back right back out on the, the field of court and create a bigger compensation. I mean, that that is fundamentally what makes the job hard. Absolutely. And during in-season, you have to be extremely careful with what you decide to mess with. And I, I tell this story in my book and I tell this when I speak all the time, like we had a guy who uh, he was a pitcher and, you know, he year after year after year had elbow pain and it would always sort of shut him down. And so I evaluated him. He had like a 15 degree elbow contracture. And I thought, OK, I'm going to like fix this guy, um, even though he wasn't having pain at the time, I decided that if he had normal elbow range of motion, he would be fine, right? Like this was part of his problem. And so we did tons of manual therapy, tons of joint moves, right? Got his elbow contracture down to like under five degrees. And sure enough, like the pitching coach comes up to me at one point, he's like, what's up with so-and-so's elbow? And I'm like, yeah, it's fantastic, isn't it? Like, <laughs> again, like I fixed it. And he's like, uh, he can't locate his fastball. He's throwing everything down and in. He's hitting every right-handed pitcher. Right. Because if you think about it, by giving him more extension, I changed his release. Yeah. Right. And so now he was like throwing down and in and hitting people. And I'm like, oh, gosh, I did that. I thinking I needed to fix this movement issue in season. Right. So I quickly learned that you have to be very, very careful with what you decide to mess with in season because it can get you into performance trouble. Right. There are certain things that you can work on. Um from an off season in an off season standpoint, um, that are the right thing to do for the long term health of the human, and the right thing to do for the long term health of the joint. But the long term goal oftentimes doesn't match the short term goal of not jacking up their performance. Right. So you've got it. You've got to decide when the appropriate time to do that is. And in season is not usually the time to do that. One thing that you. you you just said that I've tried to restate for the last 15 years is that local global dichotomy. You saw a local elbow problem. If we looked at the, the movement screen or the upper body, why, and we didn't see a huge functional problem in the past, I would have just cleaned up everything out of paranoia. And I think we all do that. So we all got to own that. But the ones that seem to be driving the local restrictions or instabilities that seem to have a direct connection or relationship to a global pattern usually are the ones that will mess up technique a little bit, but they'll recalibrate quick. If you do something that doesn't change a movement pattern, but now they can't throw around the same way, 
that'll usually get them. So if you can see that connection between the the local range of motion and the global pattern, vice versa, then they will come back to you and you will have a measurement that explains the way they feel. And there's no better way to communicate with an athlete than to gauge a number with the way they're feeling and it be accurate. And, mm -hmm. and it's got to be objective, but if it's accurate, then you either have to readjust the way they feel, but you should feel confident enough in the calibration where you're not going to negotiate the measurement. Well, Sue, so how, how much does what you just described in that scenario with the pitcher carry over to the real world? Because obviously, you know, ultimately you said something there that, that I felt was very impactful is that you still have to care about what this pitcher is going to be like 30 years from now. And how much is his sport, his profession going to impact that? How much, because obviously he's got to make his living at a very high level and you got to allow that to happen. But how much does that, that kind of way of thinking carry over into the real world or does it at all? Yeah, I, I think it does. You know, I think that there's always this balance of people's short and long term goals. Right. And so you it's really hard to make an 18 year old athlete sort of realize that there's life beyond baseball or life beyond football. But it's really easy to make a 30 year old athlete realize that there's life beyond baseball or football, right? So you kind of have to decide and, and, and figure out where they are in their career, where they are in their life cycle, where they are in their maturity levels to sort of understand, right? And so, yeah, I think that's where sort of the art of communication and, and, and the art of really sort of understanding your patient's short and long-term goals and trying to reconcile those two things for them um, and protecting them from themselves a little bit sometimes because, right, that's what you have to do as a parent, I'm sure, right? Like I'm not a kid, but, or, you know, I don't have kids, but, um, right? Like you have to allow them to, to do what they want to do a little bit, but yet at the same time, protect them from themselves in the long term. And so I kind of look at it in that way, but absolutely it applies to our general population as well, right? People get so focused on, I want to do this one activity as opposed to, oh, I want to make sure that I'm still mobile and healthy and all of those things 10, 15 years from now. Um, and, and yeah, that, that, I'm not, I'm not saying that's not hard to do. I think it's very difficult to do. Let's flip it real quick, Sue. One magic trick you have is you know how to establish rapport. And whether it's with a professional athlete or whether it's with Joe Public, I honestly think that you establish rapport and credibility simultaneously. I, everybody's got a recipe of how they do that, or they're just that transparent and authentic. But the one thing that you don't do is read your impressive resume to the person you're getting to work on. You make it all about them. You do your CSI, deductive reasoning, you explain it, you make sure no word is not clear. And I think so many people try to over explain the care they're getting ready to give. If it's good care, they're going to know it about the same time you do. And give us some, some tips or pearls about the way you've had to establish rapport. Because, I mean, you've been in some environments that probably had you at a disadvantage and you never saw it as that you just did what you did. Tell us what that is. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. I, I like to think that, that I, I can do that. Um, yeah, sometimes situations aren't always um, fantastic, right? Especially as you're acting as a consultant and kind of walking into places that maybe everybody doesn't necessarily want you. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, you know, the first thing for me is always seek to understand and whether that's from the client or whether that's from the professionals that I'm consulting with or, or and working with, I always seek to understand other people's positions. Like I don't walk in and start, like you said, spouting off everything that I know and everywhere I've been and everything that I've done. It's, it's about them. It's not about me. And I'm there to assist. However, I'm there to assist. Um, and so allowing, um, people to tell me their story, the way they want their story to be told, right? We all have a narrative. We all have a way that we want our story to be told. And instead of asking leading questions to get an answer that I want to get in my subjective, and now as I'm kind of speaking specifically towards my clients, uh, you know, just letting them tell the story, very open, open ended question. Tell me what happened. Tell me, how did that make you feel? Where, um, you know, where do you see yourself heading? Actually, Asking very, very open ended questions again so people can tell their story the way they want it to be told. So I guess that that's number two. One, seek to understand, let people tell you their story the way they want it to be told. Um, and then, you know, establishing what those patient values are. I think if you talk to patients long enough, 
especially patients who have, uh, you know, uh, have been around the block a little bit, like, like my clientele, they'll tell you exactly what has made them worse in the past. And they'll tell you exactly what has made them better. Um, and they will eventually attach their why to what they're trying to, to do. Meaning, you know, I've, I've, got a couple guys who are on the brink of retirement, right? And they've made their money. They don't need to make any more money. So their why is really not about making more money, right? It's not about making more making millions, but sometimes there's an identity issue attached to that, right? Sometimes there is, they don't know who they are after football or they don't know who they are after, you know, this next life. And so there's a lot of identity crises that sort of happens, right? So you have to kind of attach and find out people's why and find out, um, you know, they probably don't really necessarily want to run faster. They probably want to run faster so they can get another contract so they can take care of their family because they didn't grow up with anything, right? And blah, blah, blah. It kind of goes down this thing, right? So all of a sudden their goal of I want to run faster really is about taking care of their family. And that's two totally different goals that if you don't spend time talking to people and kind of connecting in that way and kind of really finding out their why, then, um, then I, I think you'll struggle kind of helping them meet their goals. Let me add the, the last pearl that you do so well, it's reflex and automatic. Not only do you let them tell their own story, once you get the measurables that you're going to operate on, you use their language to show them that you have numeric representation of what's going on that explains their story back to them. So now you're both watching the same gauges. They know how they feel and you're pretty close to watching fluctuations for the good or bad in what they do. And, and that's where you, you do it so well, you don't even realize that that's when the rabbit comes out of the hat. When you retell the story, you can't tell it if you didn't listen to it the first time, but you retell it and you add objectivity, relevance, anatomy, physiology, and now with your skilled hands, you have the capability to reset the mechanism, revisit the baseline. But it's, I think, telling them the, the FMS or SFMA or biomechanical or anatomy story without letting them set the language first is where most people get lost. They're not doing anything wrong, but you're giving somebody a language that's not relevant. And I've heard Lee do it and I've tried to do it. And, and, you know, once you can, once you can let them just tell their story and not be so quick to the tactic, you can re you can use that language to actually make them feel comfortable. And so that's, that's yeah. the other pearl that I think you do automatically. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. And, and that comes with just studying, right? Like studying the sport people are like, how do you Right, I've worked in the NBA. I've worked in major league baseball. I've worked with international soccer. Um, I've worked in the NFL. And so people always ask, how do you league hop, right? Like league hopping is not something that people tend to do. Um, and it's because I spend a lot of time with coaches and I learn the language. And then that way I can speak to the athlete, like you said, in their language, like it does matter if you call it a cleat or a boot, or if you call it the field or the pitch, right? To that athlete and to that person, those subtle language changes make them feel like you understand who they are and that you get what they're what they're about. And so, yeah, I've spent a lot of time sitting and watching film with coaches and listening to what they say. So then that way I can take it back to the, to the patient when I'm with them in the weight room or in the athletic training room. And, you know, they'll even say like, Oh gosh, that's what coach so-and-so says. I'm like, Oh really? That's interesting. Well, of course, cause coach so-and-so and I sat, you know, behind the scenes for 30 minutes yesterday and kind of talked about what he was seeing. That takes a lot of effort on the part of the clinician. And I think that sometimes clinicians get into that scenario and they think, oh, I'm the smartest person in the room. Well, you might be book wise, but man, those coaches have spent decades perfecting their craft and understanding. And man, I mean, I spend so much time with the technical and tactical coaches learning the language, learning what they see because their observation and their knowledge of the sport is insane. So, you know, I think you can't go into those scenarios acting like you're the smartest person in the room because quite frankly, you're probably not, you know, you might have the most medical knowledge in the room, but that doesn't make you the smartest person in the room. That's right. And you'll find out that, that a lot of times your medical decision doesn't have a lot of street cred, even though it's spot on, if you can articulate it in a way that can be embraced. All right, let's take a quick break. And when we come back, we'll go a little bit deeper for the professionals out there. For over 30 years, Functional Movement Systems has been the leader in movement health. 
We've developed a system that bridges the gap between fitness, performance, and healthcare professionals. Our screen and assessment tools help pros set the course for their clients and patients and gets them moving well so they can continue to move often. The functional movement screen is the foundation of our system and checks vital signs in movement competency through patterns. From youth or professional athletics to the elderly population and everyone in between, the screen is your starting point. The presence of pain is a vital sign we consider in our system. The Selective Functional Movement Assessment, geared toward healthcare professionals, is the diagnostic assessment for individuals experiencing pain during movement or with the screen. Once proper treatment is administered by clinicians, the patients are cleared to resume regular activity. The screen is once again at play to set the movement baseline. But what's next? When an individual displays competency in the screen, it's time to advance to another level. The Fundamental Capacity Screen, which tests for fitness, performance, and capacity. The system identifies whether individuals warrant additional rehabilitation or corrective exercise, or if they're ready for performance-based activity. Decide what course is right for you and get started on your professional journey today. Sue, it's hard to say your name in the industry right now without having the association to a lot of the access you've brought to a lot of different sports medicine professionals with, with dry needling. I was exposed uh, probably before you had your driver's license up in Canada <laughs> when I was going up doing my manual therapy certs. And they're like, well, you guys aren't dry needling? And, and um, I was shown uh, dry needling techniques. And I said, wait a minute, is this acupuncture? And they talked me through it. And that was, that was very early in my career. Well, the minute the state of Virginia made it not illegal for me to do that, I was like one of the first ones that was doing that. The dichotomy was I was working with uh, Kineticor looking at this dry needling from sort of a musculoskeletal map. And I was also befriended by Dr. Mark Chang, a Chinese physician, excellent acupuncturist, and a few local acupuncturists, and seeing the overlap, but a completely different conversation. And, and our last conversation, I think you're blending it in an elegant and practical way to say we don't have to say that one's not right to do the other. Are you trying to modulate the global system or change a local impairment? And and both work. And and you blended that uh, in a in a really practical way. And I think sometimes with dry needling, actually less is more. And you also help help people get that. Yeah, you know, the dry needling thing is has been a really fun part of my practice over the last decade. Uh, and it's definitely involved, uh, evolved over the years. And, and exactly like you said, I think when you first learn needling, you get super, super focused on the local effects and the local effects are extremely powerful. But the more you needle, the more you begin to use it in different situations, um, the more you kind of begin to acknowledge and respect and appreciate the segmental um things that that occur when you insert a needle into someone's body and the systemic things that occur when you insert a needle into someone's body. And so now for me, I think my practice has significantly shifted almost. I don't want to say I don't do local things because, of course, I do. But I am much more con concerned and considerate of the um, physiological effects that are happening segmentally and systemically, how we can tap into some autonomic nervous system balance, um, how we can utilize different concepts of pain control by maybe utilizing um, the contralateral limb or just a totally different extremity in order to, to tap into some segmental and systemic uh, areas of pain control. All those sorts of different things that when you first learn how to insert a needle into someone, you're just so concerned about the local anatomy in that area. Like, like obviously you want to make sure that you're being safe, what's happening in that, in that, from that local lesion. But as your practice evolves and mine has evolved quite a bit, you start to think more segmental and systemic. Um, and then to just kind of expand on what you're talking about with, with the traditional Chinese medicine stuff, I do, I love that stuff. And I've been learning that stuff and going to other countries in order to learn that stuff um, as well. And Mark Chang and I have a lot of really fun, great discussions about how we blend these concepts. Um, and, you know, I just think when you you kind of look back at some of the, the Chinese medicine things, they had it right. You know, I mean, Chinese medicine is just... Um, 
observational medicine, right? Like over thousands of years, they watched what happened to thousands of people and they created a, a system of medicine. And now what we try to do in Western medicine is reverse engineer some of those things. And when we can't reverse engineer those things, we get mad and we say that Chinese medicine is stupid and, you know, blah, 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 which obviously it's not. They had so much of it right. And so I love learning about that stuff. I love reconciling Eastern and Western medicine together. I do that in my exercise practice, right? I think that's where things like yoga and breath and breath-based meditation really come into my exercise and therapeutic activity um, interventions as well. And so I think everything from movement and meditation and now needling sort of blend East and West for me. And, and that just fits well within my own human philosophy. Well, how do you know, I guess, Sue, when you want to use a certain technique like dry needling, what helps you make that decision? Is it just, I mean, you're not dropping needles and everybody that walks in the door, I'm, I'm assuming. Yeah, no, it's definitely one part of my practice. I think that it is a powerful part of my practice because of the local segmental and systemic effects that you're always going to get when you insert a needle into somebody's body. But, you know, obviously we need to be able to um, assess and, and determine the patient values that are in front of us, right? Like a lot of times now people do know that I do a lot of dry needling and athletes know that I do a lot of dry needling. So they get referred to me because their buddy said, oh, you need to get needled by her. So they're sort of expecting me to needle them right out of the gate and they're willing to try that. So, so, you know, part of that is their patient values and what are they seeking? So to really sort of understand and respect what the patient wants, I, I think that's number one. Number two, you've got to understand their anatomy. Um, and when people have different structural um, changes, right, whether they've had a laminectomy or laminotomy or they've got scoliosis or there's um, varying body comp issues, right? Like we have to be able to understand and respect the anatomy of the person that is in front of us and then make appropriate clinical decisions from there. Um, and, you know, every needle technique is not created equal. So there are needle techniques that are way more aggressive um, and way deep, uh, way deeper than others that are more superficial and less aggressive. So, if I decide to needle somebody, I don't always needle them the exact same way. Um, so I think we just have to kind of understand that there's um, differences in each person. And, and just like anything, right, we select the appropriate modality for the person in front of us. And if we understand the anatomy and we understand their core morbidities and if it's safe or not to, to insert a needle into that person, you know, then we, we just make appropriate clinical decisions from there. So it's really just about how that person is presenting to me. If they right out of the gate tell me that they're afraid of needles, I don't even bring needles into the conversation, right? Because there are studies that show, even though there are some nice autonomic nervous system balancing things that happen, depending on where we place those needles, if they have a fear of needles, any parasympathetic is automatically negated and their sympathetic nervous system shoots up. And so that's not necessarily what we always want. So it's really just kind of about respecting that patient that's in front of you um, and making appropriate clinical decisions like anything we do. No, that's, that's wise. And I will say that the technique I chose the few times I needed Lee was absolutely aggressive, but it had nothing to do with the signals the I was reading bent. from Lee. It had a lot to do with my feelings toward him at the time of treatment. Well, you're just upset because the needle's <laughs> bent when you <laughs> shouted him into me. <laughs> no, we always do it standing. <laughs> <laughs> when you're adjusting local and global signals, what are your favorite feedback loops? And, and yeah, I am, I am sort of leading the question because that's why we, we, we connected so well on breathing and, and the way we all look at breathing and assess breathing, because that powerful reset you just talked about can actually change two things that go unpracticed during a needling session, which are even a simple screen with breath hold time sometimes changes after successful treatment. But if you do single leg stance on the SFMA or a motor control screen, you're like, wait a second, they're processing motor control better too. And so that is the, the regulating system. Sometimes you get a two for one. They'll actually have those cleansing breaths and just feel they have a release, but yet they will actually have a performance change with no practice at all. And if people aren't sensitive to those feedback loops, they probably won't make the kind of wise statements you're making. So it's that test retest that, that, had me hook, line, and sinker. Yes, it, needling was easier on my hands and it was extremely powerful. But that quick feedback without practice told me that I was adjusting the system in the right direction. 
Yeah, I, I completely agree. And I, I think one thing to understand when it comes to needling um, is that, um, like I said, all techniques are not created equal. And so when uh, the first thing we have to do is we have to decide if we're going to needle, right? Is the patient appropriate? And is the uh, do we understand the anatomy that's in the area so we can safely needle? So the first thing to do is if, you know, our, to decide if we are going to needle. Once we decide that we are going to needle, we have to decide where we are going to needle. And there are certain areas in the body that are more sympathetically stimulating and certain parts of the body that are more parasympathetically stimulating. So we need to understand where we are going to place the needles and then what we are going to do with that needle. Are we going to leave it in situ or are we going to do a lot of needle manipulation? And so what I do with the needle can also bias the autonomic nervous system one way or the other. And so once you begin to sort of understand all of those things, um, um, where I place the needles and what I do with the needle allows the system to decide what to do with that stimulus, because we have to remember that needling is a self-healing therapy. So there's nothing magical about the needle. It's just a piece of surgical steel. It's a piece of metal. There's nothing on the needle. As much as I like to think needles are magic, they're not. Um, so all we're doing is introducing a stimulus into the body and the body will do with that stimulus what it will. I cannot be arrogant enough to think because I like the musculoskeletal system that I'm just going to affect the local muscle, right? I need to understand that there is a visceral attachment to inserting that needle. There is a nervous system attachment to what, to what that needle has the potential to do. And so I can, again, begin to manipulate, um, visceral and or um, autonomic nervous system reactions based on where I put the needle and what I do with that needle. And so you're exactly right. When I'm doing something where I'm trying to, to take an athlete into a more parasympathetic state or I'm trying to decrease their fight or flight response, um, I will automatically see changes in their breathing pattern. All of a sudden, it becomes slower it becomes more deep. They're using a much more diaphragmatic breath as well as, um, you know, just getting some better costal expansion. Their entire demeanor actually even changes, right? Because I know that I've tapped into that parasympathetic nervous system then, as opposed to watching their breath get rapid or more shallow or more apical, um, then I'm not having the response that I, that I want to have. So I either need to change what I'm doing with the needle or change the location of that. Um, and then, like you said, certain things like balance, right? When people stand up and all of a sudden I was nowhere near their hip or maybe near their foot, but yet they stand up and their balance is better. Those are really interesting systemic objective measurements that we can look at to say, okay, did I, did the system do what I wanted it to do, um, on a, on a more global level? And, and that's in my opinion, really where the power of needles can come in. In the SFMA after a powerful reset like that is usually where we see the best manual therapists drop the ball. They prescribe an exercise that undershoots or overshoots and therefore doesn't reinforce. I don't expect you to go home and make a gain, but I also won't accept a 50% loss because that's on me. I, I picked an exercise that you weren't aware of. You didn't do enough. You weren't compliant. There's something that didn't work about that window of opportunity I just created. So I usually challenge the best manual therapist to start thinking more PNF and neurodevelopment and the people who already get the functional thing without a good reset, all the function in the world is offering up a meal that they can't ingest yet. So I usually use something as powerful as that in the SFMA to get the manual therapists who are really good at resets to realize you're having to reinvent the wheel most days. The people who are really good at exercise aren't getting the soil ready for the seed in time. And so we always find people that migrate into one camp and instead of letting them be comfortable there, we kindly try to nudge them back to how are we going to hold that? How are we going to get that? Not through exercise. If they could get there on their own, they'd be there. So it's, it's that back and forth. And I know you see that in your teaching right now where people want the simple recipe. And it's like a chef tastes the soup <laughs> after the well, addition of every ingredient. Well, it's still the reset. <laughs> it's still the reset that and, and Sue's describing is she sees that immediate positive feedback but that's just the start. That just allows you now to go and do everything else you need to do to hopefully get that positive feedback to, to maintain. And that's, that's also part of the, really the challenge. Once you 
create that reset, whether you do that with manual therapy or you do that with a needle or you do that with whatever tool you choose. Right. And I think that that's the thing is that people confuse tools with philosophy. Needle needles are just a tool for me. They're a powerful tool. And I like that tool. It's like a it's a my go to tool if I can use it. But it doesn't change my philosophy of movement and what I want people to do um, if it if it is a tool that brings me um, to the place where the system that I'm working with, the organism that I am working with can then make the positive adjustment in their, in their movement and in whatever they need to do, then yeah, then the tool has worked for me. If it's giving me the opposite result, then I need to choose a different tool. But my philosophy of maintaining and restoring their homeostatic balance, whether that's biomechanical, biochemical, um, biopsychosocially, like that is unwavering. And you have to sort of figure out and attach to a philosophy and realize that the tools help you express philosophy. Well, one of the things that I wanted to suggest, and I'm going to blindside you with this because I wanted to have this conversation when we were talking at dinner about a month ago and I never got there in a single conversation with Vladimir Yanda. Uh, we talked about his observation of the upper or lower cross syndrome and the way he explained that postural problem anatomically when we were looking at the movement screen, because we were both sitting there over a chapter of that I had put in a book, the deep squat is impossible, whether you have an upper or lower cross syndrome or a situation there. And what I think a lot of freshman needlers migrate to is like, everybody needs traps, everybody needs abs, everybody needs calves. And what they're actually saying is the same thing we say with a lot of ones on the movement screen, or Yonda was trying to articulate, these people are either stuck in a fixed pattern that is requiring muscles that shouldn't be holding you up to hold you up in a disorganized way. And it's either because you're too active in your work style incorrectly, or you're too neglectful in your lifestyle. And so we keep fixing movement, but it's in a toxic lifestyle or it's in an inappropriate workout. And we see that bounce back and forth, but it's really easy to put the needlers of tomorrow on a conveyor belt and just hit traps, abs, and calves on everybody. The problem is you're going to be doing those same uh, triggers a month from now because that's what they're doing to hold themselves up. And so is it the problem or is it the best way they can manage the problem without falling apart? And I think a lot of people are needling the after effects of the problem and thinking they've made leeway. You've got to strip that armor off to see the real problem, but stopping there is setting somebody up for lifelong appointments of soft tissue when it could easily be prevented. You know, people leave our level one class thinking it's about putting needles in muscles, right? Because you've got to learn the motor skill. You've got to understand the anatomy. You've got to start to learn, you know, all the bad things that can happen along with all the good things that can happen. Right. And it's sort of this like motor skill kind of prescription thing. People leave our advanced class realizing it's very little about putting needles in muscles. Um, and it's about altering the nervous system, right? If we just change the sensory input, we know sensory input is going to dictate motor output every single time. And so there's times where if I put one or two needles into someone's pec, and then all of a sudden it completely changes the position of their scapula and then how their scapular the scapula moves, well, that wasn't a structural mobility issue. That was a neurological hold that when we altered the sensory input into that tissue, we completely changed the motor output. So needles kind of become almost diagnostic for me because if I can make an immediate change in someone's movement or in their range of motion, that is borderline alarming, then I realized this wasn't a structural issue at all. This is a neurological functional issue. And I need to do a whole heck of a lot of um, therapeutic exercise and, and, and different different movement interventions, um, as opposed to a whole bunch of manual therapy, trying to elongate tissues that really don't need to be elongated. They were, they were holding on neurologically, not structurally. Yeah. They're being told to be short. They're not doing it by choice. And that's right. Yeah. No, it's, <laughs> it, but, it, but, but Lee and I experienced the same thing. The reason in the very beginning, everybody took an FMS workshop was not to learn the screen. It was to get access to our exercises because I think people were seeing that we were really trying to go as 3D as possible and chops and lifts were sort of debated and single leg deadlifts and a lot of the functional stuff we were doing, people were coming for the exercises, just like people are coming to you for the needle. But when you get on the other side, we're actually arguing for less exercises because how many of them aren't making a difference and which ones absolutely should not be avoided, you know? 100%. Yeah. The goal isn't to stick needles into people. 
the goal is to change their nervous system yep. uh, and to change how they're moving. Yep. And that was ours too, but they're coming to you for needles at first and they're coming to us <laughs> for exercises, but the ones that stick around realize it's sniper school, not, not, you know, bullet day to shoot as many as you can less shots uh demonstrate better better aiming so no it's yeah. that's I'm, well i'm glad you're going through that growing pain because you do know how to quickly bring them across that uh cavern because when when two people that are working in your clinic needle and you don't it's more about getting <laughs> it's more about getting your driver's license than what car you got but once you get on the other <laughs> side of that it does matter you know so yeah that's a great analogy yeah. <laughs> So what was funny is when Gray was learning, I was his pin cushion. Um, and I had some problems. I had, a, I had a hernia that I was trying to put off as long as possible. And so Gray said, oh, come over here. Let me do this to you. Little did I know, he whipped out some needles. I'm like, what the hell is he doing? And, and Lee, and, and really, I didn't explain much to Lee. I knew what I wanted to change in his favor and his hip. And I didn't even discuss it with him. I just started and he wasn't comfortable and he was sort of sweating a little bit. And I'm like, Ooh, I didn't want to put it there. And it was just, it was just really inappropriate and bad. And I don't oh. want anybody yeah, he's to like bring, bring other people. Hey, come and look at this. Yeah. He's got like 10 yeah. needles stuck in him. So after I got better, if ever I was in clinic, getting ready to put a needle in somebody, Lee would walk by and completely ruin the case because of my inappropriate behavior. He was just saying, Ooh, I, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't go there if I were you, but you got great a needle. Yeah. <laughs> but, but seriously, for a lot of people out there who haven't put needles in people or even experienced it, where's the place to start this conversation? Because it's powerful and it's not what most people think. So you're, you're the expert here. I was, I was in my internship when I was, but you got to have, you got to have a crash test dummy before you know if the car is safe. So that's <laughs> so true. <laughs> oh gosh, you guys cracked me up. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I always tell clinicians who are learning the technique and, and how they're going to approach this with their patient. I mean, you know, my athletes sadly understand um, drugs, right? Most of our patients do. They understand pain medication. They understand anti-inflammatory medication. So I explain it extremely simply to, to my patients. I'm like, when I insert needles into you, instead of giving you a medication, you create your own Advil and Tylenol, or you create your own prednisone or your own dose pack, right? Like whatever the thing is that they love, that they want it, that they ingest. Yeah. So I just say you know, the needle allows you to create your own Tylenol and Advil and sort of helps manage pain and inflammation. Now, and, and then that's it. It's like a simple one sentence, super easy thing. Um, you know, I don't get into all of the neurology stuff. Maybe I do over time, right? Because the patient starts to notice, like I've had guys in season say, how come when, when you needle, like sometimes we would do pregame stuff that would make them ready to go out and play. And other times we would do things that would make them really sleepy and they would notice it. They were, they would say, how come when you put the needles where you're putting them, like, it makes me feel like I want to fall asleep. And I'm like, yeah, because it's, they're in a different place than when we do it pregame and, and I do different things to them. And, and that's, you know, needles are a self-healing therapy. They sort of just allow you to, to do what, what you need. Right. And so they begin to have their own observations that then I can explain on their level. Um, so I always tell clinicians, right, like whatever your patient's going to attach to, try to to make them understand it on that level. So super simple. And then when you're starting out needling people, less is more. You know, it's like salt to food. You can always add more salt, but you can't take it away. So same thing. You can always add in another needle or maybe you can go deeper depending on the area that you're at. Or you can use a thicker needle or a more aggressive technique. But less is more for most people, especially with general population. I mean, one or two needles, three or four needles, you don't need a whole heck of a lot. Remember, we're trying to stimulate a healing response within the body and people don't always have fantastic self-healing potential, right? We don't, if people don't um, have proper nutrition, if they're a tobacco user, if they uh, are not sleeping well, um, all of these things make it really difficult to sort of self-heal, right? Like that's mm -hmm. why they're coming. So less is more, allow the body to slowly adapt, um, just like we would with manual therapy, just like we would with exercise. You don't have your, you know, 60 year old patient who's never been in the gym before squat 200 pounds under the bar on day one, right? Like you start with something super light, super easy, not many reps. You see how they tolerate it. And so needles are exactly the same thing. 
No, I think that's that's a great description, and I like what you said so much better than just the circulation cliche. Oh, we're doing this for blood flow, because the question that comes right after that was why why is blood flow bad right here? And the answer is, well, it's a neurological thing. You're using this appropriately, so there's probably not good perfusion of blood and oxygen, and so a lot of metabolites are there. But why don't you just skip it and say we're we're recalibrating the system? So if you go into the circulation thing you're making the same argument for massage and soft tissue that I think has a much greater neurological effect than it gets credit for when done right. So I like, yeah. I like that up or down regulation of the system. And when they are aware of it, it makes it that much better when they're not. That's when it's nice to have that measurement in your back pocket. Your goniometry just sh- changed by 20 degrees or your breath hold just added 10 seconds or your balance just became symmetrical. So if they're aware role. If they're not, I think that's a teaching moment that you ought to take a number. And if, if they need to explain back to you, why did this number change? You didn't practice balance. And in that little awkward moment is a aha moment that we never have a conversation about the effect of needless again. It regulated you without you having a conscious knowledge that you needed to consciously regulate. Something just happened to your benefit. So- yeah, that, that's exactly right. And I think when it when it comes to those times where you needle someone and they do have a 20, 30 degree change in range of motion, right? People look at you like you're a magician. They're like, what the heck did you do? How, you know, you usually have to stretch for 30 minutes in order to do that. And I just explain, I mean, right now, virtual reality is such a, a huge thing that everybody has tried an Oculus or they've tried like some type of virtual reality. So I, th- I utilize that analogy as well. Your sensory input dictates your motor output. So when you put those goggles on, right, your whole sensory input changes and and what you do change. Um, And so I all I did was change the sensory input into your nervous system. So your motor output changed. So, yeah, to be able to use concepts of virtual reality with them um, has been a nice way to talk about the neurological changes or the range of motion changes that happen um, and how it's not really a structural thing and how they really probably don't need manual therapy. They just needed a change in their input. And now we need to reinforce that change in their motor output. And we'll summarize that for Lee. Lee. Instead of I, trying, knew, I knew you couldn't stop talking. I knew of, you had to say instead something. Instead of trying to change behavior with behavior, what she's saying is perception drives behavior better than instructions of new behavior. So what was my perception and behavior when you came at me with about 10 <laughs> needles, getting ready to put them on my groin? I was using you as a crash test dummy. Your well-being had no effect. I, if I'd had a grapefruit, I'd have been working on that. But I wanted the grapefruit for lunch. I didn't need you after one. So... <laughs> <laughs> All right, Sue, thanks so much for uh, joining us today. We really appreciate it. We've had such a long history. As, you know, Gray and I both said you were one of the first people um, we wanted to have uh, involved in this process. So really appreciate it. So right now, give us a sense of everything you're involved with. You're, you're doing so much. Um, just give us an overall idea of what you're doing right now. Yeah, thanks. Um Yeah, things are are crazy like they are for everybody. So um, obviously have the education company right now, which we've got both in person and online courses. Um, Obviously, our in-person courses are on hold for a bit, but um, our online stuff is live and well. So you can find us at structureandfunction.net. Um, you can find me on social media. I'm on Instagram and the Twitterverse and all of those sorts of things. Um, so yeah, just really kind of focusing on education, um, both with dry needling and both kind of surrounding the book, bridging the gap from rehab to performance. So, um, yeah, that's kind of where I'm at. Let me just say approachability guys. If you're trying to learn some material and you're a little bit intimidated, she's one of the best places to start because I can't think of a more engaging or approachable clinician. So uh, Sue, you're doing a good. Oh, thank you. I really appreciate that, Gray and Lee. I mean, you guys are like my brothers. We go way, way back. And so um, it's my honor and pleasure to to be here chatting with you guys. I miss you both. And, uh, and thank you so much for those kind words. I appreciate it. That'll do it for this episode of the Movement Podcast. Thanks for listening. And if you liked what you heard, please subscribe and share it with your friends and family. If you want to learn more about our system and take the next step in your movement journey, visit us at functionalmovement.com. Until next time, be sure to move well, move often.
The dog, yeah, perfect, the dog perfect just timing. on roofing. Perfect timing. <laughs> Richard. Oh, Your dog's named going, Richard? Yeah, he's a wiener dog named Richard. <laughs> Can't call him Dick. Only when he's bad. <laughs>